Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Is everybody having a good uh, Warfighter Symposium day? Are you first sergeant? Excellent. Well, welcome back from the break. Um, before we uh, close out for today, we got two very special events. The first one, I'm, I am honored to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker and closeout speaker for the Warfighter Symposium, Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael Grinson, who is the principal military advisor to the Chief of Staff of the Army, the Secretary of the Army, and holds all matters concerning the training, readiness, and quality of life of the 1.1 million soldiers and families of the total Army. His primary focus is developing leaders of character who build cohesive teams that are highly trained, disciplined, and mentally and physically fit. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a round of applause for our guest speaker and our 16th Sergeant Major of the Army, SMA Michael Grinston. Hey. You know, um, when you're the last speaker and you're the Sergeant Major of the Army, you absolutely have to do something unique. So it's kind of weird that there's people way back there and then there's nobody up here. <laughs> so you know it's coming, right? Do I even need to say it? <laughs> like when you get up here, they're gone. So take the name tag, throw it away, sit, sit somebody next to General Leneve does not cliff. Go right there. No. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, keep some space. I don't know, maybe that's a, was that a COVID risk mitigation thing? That like, you, like come on, I got to see people. I got to see your faces and... So when I say something crazy, you get that look and look at me like, oh, sorry, Major, that's just terrible. There you go. Now we're getting lively. You can shake hands. Maybe not. Don't breathe on each other. Hold your breath or something. <laughs> so. My God, man. You no, know, Brian Barker said, I'm not going all the way to the front. You're still at the back of the front of the back or something. And he's like, hey, I'm still doing this. And good news is that I, I wore a wireless mic, and I can move around, I can get on the stage, or I can stay down here. So is that good? We're still good. Okay, good. So uh, I appreciate that little movement drill, and then people when come in, it won't be awkward. If you need to leave or do something, that's fine. So I, I just want to say thanks um, for having me, General Brown and Sergeant Major Daly, the 15th Sergeant Major of the Army. Anything I say is bad, it's your fault. You mentored me, it's all your fault, so you didn't coach me well enough, so I re really appreciate you for being here. Uh, so thank you for everybody, thanks for uh, hosting this event. No, 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 only bad. And so if I say anything bad, it's your fault. If anything's good, it's Jim Brown. That's fair. And he says that's fair. Okay, so uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for letting me uh, be a part of this great organization in this space. Uh, great Warfighter, I think the first one we've ever done like this at Fort Bragg. So I'm really excited uh, to be here with you. Before I even talk about anything, I do want to thank another group of uh, folks that we thank a lot, but we just don't think enough. And uh, personally, it's the families. And you're going to hear that uh, theme throughout everything that I say is I really want to just say thank you uh, for everything that you do, and when you get home tonight, please give a special thanks to your families. You wouldn't be here, and you can't do what you do without your families. You couldn't do those four no-notice appointments that the chief talked about this morning without your families. And I would not be the Sergeant Major of the Army without my wife and my children and uh, the support. So um, special thanks to all the families. I'm going to take you through a little bit of a history, and I think that short history really defines where we're going for the future as a warfighter. So please bear with me, because most of you in this room may have actually lived this history, but I like to tell you about it, because sometimes we have what I call short-term memory loss. So I'm going to talk about this, but I want to just kind of remind folks where we're at, because our country sometimes have forgotten what your military and specifically your army has done for you in the last three years. And I'm just going to hit a few of the highlights and you're going to understand what I'm talking about. So I took over as Sergeant Major of the Army in 2019 and 
it almost felt, you know, it's this rush, and I thought, oh, this is, it's really busy, but, you know, is it that bad, and is, is it coming, and what's, you know, what is it? And then December 19 kind of happened, and I don't, it's just been chaos ever since. Um, that's what it kind of felt like. And why do I say December 19? Most people don't realize um, we were still in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we still had soldiers that were dying. And I will never forget this. Um, I took about a week or so on leave, I was, and it was Christmas Day, and we were bringing some soldiers back from an SF team, more than one killed in combat. And we were going to receive the bodies on Christmas Day on 2019. Um, and I went there, I, I still can't get that out of my mind, is, you know, the children will forever remember Christmas is the day Dad came home. That was tough. Um, I would say I was there, and it was tough on the families. It was tough for me to go through that. And I think, okay, and that's what started this really tough time. That's the day I go and said, well, it might have been August 9th when SMA Day left, but it really... It really hit me was that day, because about five days later, we had the first no-notice deployment for the 82nd. It's like, nope, go now, when, right now. Nobody knew, just go. And most people don't realize how close we came to go to war with Iran. And that's really what the Department of the Army was looking at. It's like, oh my goodness, we just killed Soleimani, what's going on? Uh, so we had a lot of things to do in January of 2020. But there was a couple other things going on in January 2020. This thing called COVID was over Korea, it was going somewhere else. It's like, hey, what are we going to do with all that? Uh, so we had COVID. And then March of, I think 14 March, officially days, like everything was like, ah, stop everything. So that's a March of 2020. Well, nothing else happened. Well, for the Army, in April, Vanessa Guillen goes missing. So in April of 2020, Vanessa Guillen goes missing, and we really find her around June, July. Um, so we're going through some really tough times in the Army, and we still got COVID. And in May, the whole country erupts with civil unrest. COVID didn't go away. We still got soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then most people don't realize in January 2020, we had the highest hurricane season we've had in over 100 years. And at some point at the end of the, of the summer of 2020, we had floods on the East Coast, and the West Coast was burning. COVID's still there, the country's in civil unrest, we're trying to figure out what to do with COVID, we've got hurricanes, and then we're going to do an election. Nothing really happened with that. Um, <laughs> okay, I was just making, I, I'm checking to see if you're listening, by the way. Um, then we have an election, and then we have, in December of 21, my RTEP's still going, we get the vaccine. And I always talk about this, and I highlight one specific person. Um, I will forever, while I'm alive, praise General Perna and the United States Army. Um, if you went back six months prior to December of 20, um, one person was asked to stay on duty. Actually, he wasn't asked to stay on duty. He was asked to run the Project Warp Speed. And what a great American to say, I want to stay on active duty. And most soldiers in the back go, oh, what's the big deal as a four-star general? Well, if he retires as a four-star general with 40 years, he's going to get 100% of his base pay. So I usually say, well, he just saved the country for no pay. That's kind of the, the great American that he is. He didn't create the vaccine. He figured out how to get the vaccine out to the country. Not the Army, not DOD, the country. Your Army did that, specifically led by General Perna. Okay, so we got civil unrest, that's still going, got this election, this is December, and then January 2021, 20, nothing happened in January, right? <laughs> Not on one day, right? Uh, and I was on Fort Hood. I was on Fort Hood on uh, January 6th. And actually, I think we were actually flying to Fort Hood, and I'm watching the TV, I was like, oh, well, that's not gonna go good. Um, so we have civil unrest, that's kind of still going. We have January 6th, and now we're in 2021. We still got COVID, um, we still got all these things. And then we have what most people forget is really like this huge no-notice deployment of our Army National Guard. Like thousands, like 
26,000 to make sure we have a peaceful transition of power. It's like, what's the big deal? I don't know, since I've been an American and alive, we've always had a peaceful transition of power. Um, and that was a big strain for the United States Army National Guard. And they've been through all those. So 2021, nothing else happened in 2021, right? In July of 2021, nothing going on? We leave Afghanistan. Right? Uh, most people may have missed it. We left. All combat troops left Afghanistan in July of 2021. And then we have to send, we had to reoccupy Afghanistan. And most people say, what's the big deal? You army folks. That's the easy, right? Oh yeah. All these other countries just go pick up, fly all the way to some other country, reoccupy, and then exfil 120,000 Afghans out of Afghanistan. Pretty simple exercise, right? Most Americans have actually forgot that, that that easy button and how we make the most complex things look easy. That's August of 2021. Um, and we got 2022, and we think, yes, it's over. The Pentagon RTEP, what else? What else could happen? And then February 22, anybody? Um, Russia invades Ukraine. It's like, oh, well. The most fascinating thing for me as a Sergeant Major of the Army in the Pentagon, after those three years, the most fascinating thing of all that was we got, oh, we know how to do that. I'm mean, going to be honest with you, that was the one, you know, I don't know how to fight a virus. Like, what's a panther fusion thing? How do I get, like, testing for COVID? What's COVID? Like, what does that stand for? You know, we, that we didn't understand. But when R Russia invaded Ukraine, that we knew. Uh, and I'm really proud of, you know, the Department of Defense and the Department of the Army. Because, believe it or not, that was the one uh, when the Pentagon went into action. I could just say how proud. Uh, I am of the Pentagon, because that one we're like, okay, we got this one. This one we got, uh, because uh, the last three years have been so exciting. But with all that still going on, at the base of that was our families. Uh, we extended a whole bunch of units. And we didn't go into Ukraine for obvious reasons, but there's one ID unit that said, no, we need you to stay there and just keep doing what you're doing. Well, what are we doing? Just keep doing what you're doing. And the families were behind them all the way. And that's why I keep thanking the families. But with all that in the last three years that we've been going on, a whole bunch of things could have gone wrong. And it didn't. I mean, imagine if in that civil unrest, and if anybody saw, there was a video of a young sergeant. And he's standing there. And they're just going at him. I mean, I mean, the protest was really going at him hard. I watched it. I mean, I was like, I don't know. Never move. Army National Guard soldier. Imagine if that soldier just hits that person or shoots somebody. He says, I'm tired of you cussing at me, spitting on me. And that's what was going on. Imagine that that happened, but it didn't. Imagine if a paratrooper on that gate, you know, just opens fire because, you know, I, I, you know what happens? But it didn't. Uh, but it didn't. What if when we go to Europe, somebody, you know, on the border does something wrong? Uh, but it didn't. So all these things could have happened, but it's the discipline and what the chief was talking about, that cohesive unit, uh, the discipline of the United States Army, because a lot of bad things could have happened in those three years, and it didn't. It's because of your efforts. And I say it's because we have, we have the best army in the world, and at the baseline of that is the best NCO Corps in the world. But that, you know, don't, don't think that's, you know, something that you've earned. You don't, you know, you've earned it, but you got to keep it. And this is the first of maybe a couple Alabama football uh, analogies, so bear with me, roll tide. Yeah, yeah there's at least one in here. Okay, so, um, you know, it's like when you play football, right? You know, everybody wants to be number one. Everybody wants to beat the United States Army. We cannot lose. You can't have an off season. You can't have a bad day. And I'm not feeling it today. 
And all those things I've just told you, you cannot have an off-season and you can't have a bad day. And as the NCOs and the pride of our Army, you've got to have a good day every day. And you can't just sit there and go, well, I'm good. Why? Because I said I'm good. You've got to earn it. You've got to go out and you've got to be fit, disciplined, and highly trained every day. And you can't have an off day. And you're the pride. The NCO Corps is actually the pride of the other countries. And I was in Poland. I was visiting after uh, February. And one of the Polish generals walked up and said, Sergeant Major, this is what I need. I need an NCO Corps like the United States Army. Here's my Sergeant Major. Whatever you need, I'm here. We need some of that. Because they have seen it work. And then they've seen it fail. Because all I was thinking is, uh, you know, a Russian tank column, Ilmov, it's just kind of like dissipated, and nobody's moving. And they shot the commander. And all the NCOs are like, well, we'll move faster now. And okay, no, that's not true. It's not true. <laughs> Sir, don't come after me. <laughs> so, so. But you know what I mean, right? We are not going to stop. We have great leaders, officers and NCO, and when something happens... It wouldn't matter. We're like, okay, that's bad, but this is our mission. We're going to execute that. And we've seen that when you don't have that in-depth from not just your officers, but your NCOs. We, I think we've seen that. And that's why the Polish General said that. We have to have a strong NCO car, and we've got NCOs in the room. We've got to earn the respect of our officers every day. And you can't just say, well, that's what we used to do. You've got to build it every day. We got to build those cohesive teams, and I already told you they're highly trained, disciplinedly, and mentally and physically fit. Normally, the chief and I say fit, and I want to tease out those two, is you have to be, personally, I think the only way you can be fit is you have to be mentally fit and not just physically fit. And I can talk about that uh, when I open up the questions. We have some questions. We have to be more ready, and we have to be more lethal. And somebody said, well, Sergeant Major, what are you going to do? So here's some of the things we're working on. We're working on getting our staff sergeants in the right place at the right time and long enough to do that. And I'll ask, take questions about more of what we're doing. I know I am, everybody's a big fan because I increased the, the time in grade before we become a sergeant first class. I know all the staff sergeants in the room are really enjoying that. I uh, went from 18 months to, to 48 months. We've in, We've actually implemented the expert soldier badges because we want soldiers to be expert. You know, ex and we combine that. We're also looking to revamp the basic leader course for our NCOs. We're gonna bring back the, a little field time. We're gonna bring back land nav. So we're gonna bring those things back into BLC. And as everybody's going through right now, and I was talking to Sergeant Major Holland, the best squad competition. Uh, hopefully everybody's excited about this. Uh, it's the first time we've done a best squad competition. I know we've done those in the Army, but this is the first time we've done it for all of the Army. I know there's a couple gauntlets thrown down there right now. So USASOC, when I was in the back room, was like, ah, the Ranger Regiment. And then Sergeant Major Holland says, I don't know, 18th Airborne Corps or Force Com. So best squad competition's coming. We're also trying to work on our holistic health and fitness. Looking at the holistic health and fitness teams, we have to get those out to you, and we have to think differently on holistic health and fitness. And a lot of times, especially units here, you know, Fort Bragg, we're hard. We don't sleep. We don't eat. <laughs> and I said, okay, um, you will be less lethal uh, if you don't sleep, and you'll be less lethal if you don't eat. That's a proven fact. So all that badge of honor is like, I didn't sleep last night. Okay. You're making life or death decisions without the full capacity of your brain. Are you okay with that? Life or death decisions. You have to, we have to do better with our sleep and our nutrition and holistic health and fitness. Um, we're trying to increase our lethality at the basic leader course with fitness also, the physical fitness is now you can get a qualification, a tactical strength and conditioning and facilitator course. When you get out of BLC, you could be certified as a conditioning facilitator. You have to, it's an elective. We're trying to make it required for all to make us more lethal and more ready. Um, and this morning you talked, you heard the chief talk about 
3.0 is coming, you know, and how we fight in the multi-domain operations. Uh, and I'll put the extra thing on there. We just published the new 7.0, and that's how we train. And it asks you all, if you haven't read that document, it's really good. And I know General Randy was working on that when he was cat. That's how we train, I think, if, you know, for, especially for the NCOs in the room. Um, when you are, or should be, the expert trainer in individual small teams and crews, you should know and read doctrine. And I would start with uh, 7.0. And number two, we actually put back in there, and we keep taking it out every once in a while. The NCOs don't train, it's the principal training, and then we put it back in, we take it out, we put it back in. So uh, it's back in there. NCOs, and I just said it, soldiers, crews, and small teams. So 7.0, it asks you to go through and read through that. And with all that said, why do we want to be more ready and more lethal? I think that's, that, that's clear and evident of what's going on and all the things you've heard, all the presenters talk about uh, in the last couple of days, uh, and even this, just this morning, is we have to be ready. And I was in the UK, and we started talking about you know, our, our, our armies, and we talked about ready, and, and um, I was on a panel from different countries. And somebody said, well, you know, I don't want to say certain things and, you know, because somebody may be listening. And I said, okay. And they came around, they said to me, I said, I want you to listen. I want you to hear, if you mess with the United States Army, we're going to kick your rear end. And I'm okay with that. You can listen to this all you want. We have a better NCO Corps than you do. We have a better Army than you do. And if you're listening to that, I hope you are. Because don't be fooled, whatever you're seeing, we still have the best army in the, in the world and we got to earn it. Um, so I'm not afraid to say that openly to anybody. And I'm really proud of that. Um, because we have to be ready in everything that we do. Um, we only have a couple more minutes, so I'm just going to close that say uh, we will be ready. We have to have ready, lethal warfighters that are highly trained, disciplined, and fit. And I look forward to your questions. SMA, Sergeant Major Pitt, 82nd. Uh, could you touch on retention and, you know, the challenges we're facing and, and how the Army is uh, adapting? I know I saw the program that we're about to put in place to allow people to meet the standard to come into the Army. So if you could touch on that a little bit. Okay, you said retention, but you're talking about accessions. Uh, both, SMA. It was the double-ended question. Okay, it's so the open-ended question for anything I want to talk about, retention and, and accessions. Okay, uh, cool. Um, so this actually, a lot of people try to put these together, but i am be honest. Uh, right now, our retention numbers are going well. And I had a retention NCO uh, at lunch. I'm not sure if he's in here today. He said, Sergeant Major. I hear all this stuff about retention and we're not doing well. I was like, I don't know, what are you, what are you talking about? He's like, retention's not going well. I'm like, no, that's not actually true. So I pulled the numbers for like the last, you know, five or 10 years and this is what we told the Army to retain and that's what we've retained. We've exceeded that, you know, year after year. Um, it's our woes are really with assessments. We're trying to do our best because our sessions are going so poorly. We are trying to keep the absolute best quality soldiers we can in the Army. However, once they get in the Army, we are seeing the same numbers for retention uh, that we've seen historically and exceeding whatever we've given the Army. So we put those two together, but they're not really related. People will leave the Army. People have to leave the Army. Sergeant Majors. You have to leave the Army. At some point, you're, you're going to be a soldier for life, but you got to get out of the active component. Okay, you got to go. So people will retire. They'll, they'll ETS. That's okay. We need some, people to, some other people to get out of the Army sometimes too, right? So not everybody that comes in gets to stay forever in the Army. That's normal. So retention is, is going well. We're trying to make up the woes in a session. And the reason I say that is because some people will go, well, you know, we've seen this mass exodus out of the army. Not true. It's not true. When you join the army, a lot of people are saying, yeah, I'll stay in. But we got to get you to join the army. And, and that's where we're seeing our struggles, right? 
is that I need you to go out, and I, I know the chief talked about it, I know if anybody else talked about it today, is that we need you to go out and talk to your communities. And a few years ago, as uh, Forcecom, you know, I'd said, hey, go out. And this is a couple of things we learned is, number one, we said, if you go out, go to your community, take two people with you, take a sol two soldiers, one, uh, one man and one woman. You know, because most people think, you know, there may be no women in the Army. Not really true. <laughs> so, and, and take a young soldier with you. And I'm assuming when you go, you're old. David. I'm just letting you know now. So Sergeant Major Pitt's old. We're old. I cannot relate to the, you know, the 18, 19 year olds. They don't, I can try to talk with them, but when I brought a young soldier, they're like, oh, that's awesome. Um, so our, our woes, in my opinion, are with the sessions. People don't want to join organizations. You know, we're, the police are having the same problem. Um, we want you to join the Army. When you're coming in the Army, um, we have seen our retention numbers uh, on par or higher than we've had in the past. And I say that because uh, some people will assume that, oh, I joined the Army, I just don't like it. That's not true. It's, we need people to come in the Army. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. Next question. Who, has a, who else has a question for the Sergeant Major of the Army? It'll be the fastest. Oh, it's, there's, there's one here. Sure. Hey, it's uh, Sergeant Major Bostart, 319th IEW Battalion. Um, my question's on talent management. Uh, one of the things that we lost when we went from um, promotion boards to evaluation boards was a clear visibility on who was likely to move up to the next position. And I feel that the results we get out of the eval boards don't really show any of that. Um, and I'm wondering since we still track high potential for promotion and we still use it for assignment management, is there a reason that we can't identify the people um, on the OML's list as, as HPFP so that we can still manage, oh, this is the person I want to put into a first arm position because they're going to promote into it or those types of things? Yeah. We, we talked a lot about unmasking and masking the OML. So it really came out about six months ago. I told them we're going to at some level, we're going to unmask it. I, I don't think we've decided whether that's going to be division, core, force com. Somebody's going to get the OML. Um, but I do want to caution everybody is that we, the OML didn't guarantee that that person is going to get promoted. Um, so that's, that's the, one of the reasons that we have it completely just unmask it. Because you get this OML and you're like, ah, well, I'm ahead of this person, and that's the person that needs to go in that job. The OML is exactly what it's, it's an order of merit list, not a guarantee to be promoted. Um, so the person over here may have, um, you know, all the, the requirements that they need to do that position and, and they may get promoted. Now, what I have done in the last year that I thought you may ask about is just like we said, no, we are gonna go straight off the OML. We're not skipping numbers. And I talked about that last October at AUSA. I actually come in, it was just master sergeants. I said, uh, we've made a mistake. Um, there was some, and I could talk about it, um, is that we had, some MOSs had sent a whole bunch of people to school. And then when we started the OML, um, we said, well, that MOS doesn't get any school slots because you've already, you know, send all these people to school. Um, so you're not getting any school slots. So I, I'm number one on the OML. I'd already sent this other person who's number 100 on the OML to school, but I didn't get any school slots. And we just promoted 100. So I had a problem with that. Um, and it was no fault of number one on the OML. Um, so that's another reason why we're, we're trying to work on how we unmask OMLs. But what I did say in, in in October at AUSA, I said, we're going to promote straight off the OML. And then probably about a month later, we just said, we're doing that pretty much for everybody uh, until we can have our school slots catch up to what we need to to, to not promote uh, people that haven't gotten education yet. So right now, we still have yet to stop that. So I pretty much suspended 
you know, so SMA Daddy, did, did he leave? No, please don't come after me. I, suspect, I did it for all MOSs, I suspended step. Not for all the bad, anything bad. It was uh, because our school slots weren't enough to get people trained and we were going way down that OML. And I didn't want highly qualified NCO, really talented, go, this person is less qualified, less talented to get promoted ahead of me. Um, and it's not my fault. I was ready to go to school and I couldn't even get a school slot. Um, so monthly we look at it. So are we going back to step? But right now we've pretty much suspended the select train and educate promote um, requirement for all MOSs. It's just to give us a time uh, to get the school right. Cause I didn't want to disadvantage those that had not been to school when it was not their fault. Um, so that's where we're going, but we are looking to unmask the OML at some point. Yeah. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give uh, our 16th Sergeant of the Army a big round of applause. So I'm not cutting him off because we're going to hear a whole lot more from him because I'm going to invite him up to the stage now because this Sergeant of the Army, Grinston, is going to lead our sixth and final panel.